Uh, my name is Rishab. You can call me Rish. I'm from National Junior College. Um, and I represent Building Blocks, which is an organization in Singapore led by students, created by students, for students, uh, to, enri to promote enrichment of computer science education. And uh, we want to bring more people on board into the computer science journey. So uh, before we begin, uh, let me introduce uh, myself. So I am a final year student at National Junior College. Yes, unfortunately, I'm taking my A-levels this year. Uh, I am certified in machine learning and deep neural networks from Stanford University. Uh, I worked in and around Singapore at a couple of places. I was an ex-machine learning researcher at ASTAR, and uh, I co-founded an AI startup uh, last year uh, with a friend of mine. And now I'm heading the AI lab at this startup called Unscramble AI. I write articles on machine learning and generally on tech and reviews on Medium, and I open source stuff on GitHub. Uh, I joined Building Blocks this year, and so far the journey has been great. So if you're a student, please do take note that Building Blocks is hiring. Uh, so you can join us if you're looking for some fun. OK, so for today's workshop, uh, I'm assuming that uh, you know a bit of Python, how to work with files, how to manipulate data in uh, a basic way. Uh, and a bit of high school math, you know, uh, working with algebra, vectors, uh, graphs, and a bit of calculus that is differentiation. But don't worry, the math isn't that hectic or crazy. And um, if you have any confusions or doubts, just uh, shoot a question. So machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence where we enable computers to learn without explicitly giving them rules. So given some training data, the machine learning algorithm is able to find patterns in the data and is able to give predictions when released into the world. So for example, uh, Google Translate, it works using machine learning where it was trained on huge bodies of text in two different languages and uh, it basically now has been released uh, online. You know, you could quick Google search and uh, You'll open up Google Translate, and you can type in anything. It'll translate it for you. That is one form of machine learning. So machine learning, uh, before machine learning came into play, uh, back then in the growing years of tech, ever since the internet boom in the early 2000s, uh, we didn't have data, that much data. And at the same time, we didn't have enough computing power or lots of uh, power to run really huge algorithms, right? So we resorted to traditional rule-based algorithms. So what do I mean by rule-based? Say you want to create an algorithm that's able to classify two different types of flowers, right? So you ha there are two different types of iris flowers, iris setosa and iris virginica. Uh, so say you made this algorithm that's, that I give you an image of of a flower and you're able to tell me whether it belongs to one of these classes or labels, right? So what a traditional rule-based algorithm programmer would do is he'd write rule after rule after rule and at one point of time he gets sick of it because how many rules can you write? But then it's worse if I give you an anomaly. If I gave you a picture that was supposed to be one of the flowers, but your rule-based algorithm gave a wrong prediction, saying it's something else, we have a huge problem on our hands if, say, in the case, it's been released online or released to the public for use. So say I give it a picture of Iris Virginica. It'd be a huge problem if your rule-based algorithm predicted it as iris setosa just because it looks the same or almost looks the same as iris virginica or iris setosa given the image that is provided. This is exactly why we have relied on the support of machine learning ever since we've been able to get lots of training data and lots of compute power ever since 2013 with Google, DeepMind, all these huge companies embarking on all these AI experiments and adventures so that life becomes so much more convenient for all of us. So in current times, when it comes to training data or data as a whole, we can see that it's really complex. You know, it's not really perfect. Sometimes it needs a bit of cleaning, dusting. Uh, it's not readily available for use in machine learning. 
So we need to clean it, and at times, data can be of low quality. Sometimes they can be from surveys, or they can be from these questionnaires, but at times they're incomplete, and you need to bridge the gaps, fill in the gaps to ensure that your training data is good for use. So as the rule-based example that I mentioned earlier, you can't keep writing rules. There comes a point in time where you can't think of new rules, and your algorithm keeps failing because, well, it's predicting the wrong thing because two things look the same. Which is why, again, we need machine learning. So ever since machine learning came into play, we've had a huge boost in performance uh, in algorithms. And whenever you need accurate predictions, you would go to machine learning, some form of statistical machine learning, or neural networks, if you heard of them. right? And the beauty of machine learning or neural networks is that it's able to find even more complex patterns in data so that compared to the rule-based counterpart, it's so much more versatile in being used in, in certain use cases. So machine learning has penetrated almost every industry known to man. It's been used in banking, finance, social media recommendation algorithms on Instagram and YouTube, and even your assistants like Google Assistant and Siri. It all uses some form of machine learning which powers it to make your life much more convenient. And funny thing, it's also being used in cucumber farming. So there was this one person who used a machine learning algorithm in his cucumber farm in South Korea, and he helped his dad by actually segregating the two types of cucumbers or the different types of cucumbers into different baskets using machine learning. He scanned the cucumber and saw what kind or type it is, and well, he put it into different buckets. So I think you, can, uh, you have some picture or some clarity as to why machine learning is so useful, not only in tech, but also in other fields of life, such as, well, agriculture. We see a huge boom in agri-tech and all these startups coming up and using AI and transforming the lives of many people who, work, who perform traditional manual labor and by leveraging the immense power of machine learning. So at the end of this workshop, I think uh, one takeaway would be asking yourself how valuable you would be if you knew machine learning, right? You'd have so much power in your hands. I like to call machine learning engineers wizards because, well, they have the key to a better future, a more convenient future for all of us. So for this workshop, uh, it's roughly two hours, but I'll keep it short. I know it's late into the night. So, uh, so thank you for coming uh, at this hour. So we'll be, I'll be running through this basic form of machine learning algorithm called linear regression. And then we'll be, we'll be doing some theory. I'll be showing you a bit of math. Uh, warning uh, that, yes, math is involved, but don't worry. If you have a question, just shoot. And then uh, if everyone is OK and we can touch base, uh, I'll be moving on to this basic neural network architecture called the single layer perceptron. And uh, what we will be doing is applying all the knowledge that we'll be gaining in this workshop. Uh, I'll be doing like a live coding uh, session with all of you, uh, and we'll be testing it on real life data sets. So uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that's to spark a bit of interest. Uh, you know where it's applied and whatnot. Okay, linear regression. Linear regression is a linear model. So we know that the relationship between variables x and y is defined uh, by a best fit line, right? And the best fit line it has a relationship of fx equals mx plus c, or y equals mx plus c, as some of us have learned in high school, right? So m is the gradient, and c is the intercept, and together with the x and y variables, they're able to create the best fit line on a graph. So to imagine, so before we delve into the math and all the concepts, uh, I'd like you to visualize what linear regression really does. So say you're playing football, I give you a blindfold, uh, you're blindfolded, and then I, I spin you, and you have no sense of direction or orientation, you have no idea where the goal is, and say I tell you, okay, immediately take a kick at the goal, I don't care if you know where the goal is or not, just take a kick. And you take the kick, and wow, I mean, obviously the ball flies somewhere else because you have no idea where the goal is, and you have no idea where you are in relation to that goalpost. 
And then I ask you to take off the blindfold and see how off your kick is or how, uh, how badly you kicked in a random direction. And I tell you to take a kick again. I wear the blindfold and take a kick again. And you can see that now you kind of have some idea of where the goal is because when you open the blindfold, you kind of saw where you were, you saw where the goalpost was, and now you kind of have a rough idea of where exactly to kick or which uh, direction you're supposed to kick in. And you repeat this process multiple times and you can see that the ball or the goal you miss less frequently and the distance between your kick and the actual goalpost keeps decreasing as you keep improving or you get a better understanding of where you are in relation to the goalpost. So similarly, linear regression is a way of taking random variables, the gradient and the y-intercept or the vertical uh, uh, intercept. It draws the line, uh, which is analogous to a football player taking that random kick. Uh, it sees how off that line is uh, and analogous to how when you take off the blindfold, you see where you are, where the ball went and where the goalpost actually is. So, uh, and you correct the variables M and C, uh, the gradient and the y intercept slowly. Uh, just how the football player corrects his stance, his positioning and his kicking speed and angle. And again, this process is continuous so long as or until the person's able to get the ball into the goal, or in this case, we achieve the best fit line or something that's close to it. So this is linear regression in action. So the green line is the best fit line or the thing we're trying to emulate. And the red line, we're constantly updating. So you can see the red line's actually moving up, right? So, and we can see that the gradient or the slope of the line and the y-intercept, it's changing with every time it moves up or down, which shows that the linear regression algorithm is trying to emulate or trying to come as close as possible to the best fit line. And today we're gonna do exactly this. Okay, so earlier I mentioned that the relationship between x and y or x and fx, which is basically y, is y equals mx plus c, where m is the gradient and c is the y-intercept. We call this the hypothesis function in machine learning. So the hypothesis function is basically a guideline or this, set, this rule that we need to follow to get the best fit line. So if you were to convert this to simple Python, you can, you can, say def, you can define a function, hypothesis function. You can pass in the variables, the uh, y-intercept c, the gradient m, and the x value and return mx plus c. So while well, we plotted the line, Right, so we have the values of m, x, c, and y, and we're able to get a decent relationship, y equals mx plus c. But as I said, the football player took the wrong kick at the start. He has no idea where the goalpost is, where the ball is, and where he is. So similarly, the values that are initialized for the gradient and the y-intercept are completely random at start. And slowly through the prox process of linear regression, we optimize these values of the gradient and the y-intercept. So when we've predicted uh, this line relationship of y equals mx plus c using these uh, variables m and c, we wanna know how off the kick is, right? We wanna know how off the line is to the best fit line or the line that it's supposed to be. So to find the error, we use this thing called the loss function or the error function or the cost function. There are many names to it, but uh, in machine learning, we usually go for the loss function. So loss function is a mathematical formula which takes in your variables and uh, it compares it with the real values that you're supposed to be in the future and uh, gives you the difference between how, what you are currently at and, and the real values. So yes, this is the loss function. Uh, it may look scary, but all it does is it takes the difference of fx and y, which is basically fx is our line and y is the real value. We take the difference and we square them. And this, this thing over here, uh, this, it's, we call this sigma notation. Some of you may have learned it in high school. Uh, 
So what the sigma notation does is it basically takes the sum of all these differences for all the examples in our data set or the training data set that we're feeding the model. And it just takes the average so as to make the difference or the error more consistent across all the examples. Again, if we were to com uh, compute this or change this into simple Python, we'd uh, define a loss function where we take in the gradient, the y-intercept, x and y. We initialize this variable called total loss, which is basically across all the examples, uh, this is the loss that represents this round. So when I say around, uh, remember how the football player, he takes the kick and uh, he checks where, like, where the ball is and where he is in relation to the goal? Uh, here I'll be calling it around, but in machine learning we call it an epoch or an iteration, right? An iteration is basically one step that's closer to our final objective of optimizing that line to the best fit line. Again, so we convert, we get the hypothesis function, which is basically y equals mx plus c or fx equals mx plus c. We find the difference between our line and the actual real value. Uh, we square them and we take the sum across all training examples and we take the average and we append it or we enumerate this total loss variable which is over here and we return the total loss. So what exactly does the loss function do? It takes our line, as mentioned earlier, compares it with the real value of what the line should be and it gives you that margin, that error margin of how off you are in your prediction of the line or the values for the gradient and y-intercept. So that step that was in the brackets, fx minus y whole square, it basically represents the line, the blue line is the, is, the, uh, is the line that we currently plotted using our random values of m and c. And the pink color dots are the actual real life values. And the red lines you see is basically the difference of fx minus y. So if we take this y position and the y position that we predicted, this red line shows the difference, which is basically denoted by that inner statement in that formula that I showed you. But then uh, if we take a random kick and we correct ourselves, we need to know by how much we should correct ourselves. The loss function only shows our error, but the actual process of taking that error and optimizing the gradient and y-intercept using that error margin is uh, what we should perform next so that we are one step closer to our final objective of uh, getting close to the, f the best fit line or something close to that. So in high school, some of you may, have, most of you have may have learned about uh, differentiation or derivatives uh, and whatnot. And so here, when we perform differentiation on that formula I just showed you, it actually gives us that change in the error between what we were at in the previous round and what we're supposed to be in the next round. Uh, it may sound abstract to you. Uh, machine learning is, uh, is a bunch of abstract concepts, but hopefully through this workshop you have a clear understanding of what really happens in these kind of algorithms. So if we calculate this derivative of that formula, that loss function or the loss formula that was showed earlier, uh, we, com we equate this to zero. That means the change is close to zero and when something is close to, uh, is zero, the variables that are dependent on it, which is basically the gradient and the y-intercept, is either at its maximum or minimum, right? So uh, here we need a value of that loss value or the loss function where it gives the least possible error or the minimum error, which is if you were able to plot a curve of the, of the rounds and the loss and the loss values, you'd get a U-shape or convex function where that bottom or that plateau at the bottom of the U-shape curve is where you want to reach. And we, na we gradually go down that slope until the point where that gradient value is zero or minimum. And we call this in machine learning or linear regression or statistical uh, algorithms, we call this gradient descent. So I mentioned earlier that uh, the, it forms a U-shaped curve. 
and we're trying to get to the bottom of that curve, and we're basically jumping gradient values of the loss function where the loss is the minimum. So there's one type of differentiation called partial differentiation. Uh, it may be out of the high school syllabus, but uh, if you've taken a math or statistics course in university, uh, you may have come across partial differentiation. Uh, but uh, you don't need to know how exactly it works for this workshop, but please note that uh, it's what we use to get the derivatives of the loss function. So we take the derivatives of the loss function with respect to the gradient value m and the current y-intercept c. And uh, these are the formulas that we get after performing partial differentiation. We just basically get the average of the sum of, uh, of our line minus the, the real line or the best fit line. And, uh, and, that's the <coughs> and that's the derivative of the y-intercept with respect to the loss function. And uh, if, we, if we were to do the same for the gradient, uh, it would give us the same of fx minus y. And uh, if you actually do the math, you'll calculate that we just need to multiply the x value at the end. Again, if we were to convert this into simple Python, we uh, define a function called get derivatives. Where we do, where we set the values of the derivatives in with respect to the y-intercept c and gradient m, and we get the hypothesis function. And as shown by the formula here, uh, these two variables update this value of dc and dm, which is basically the derivatives with respect to c and m, and we average them and we return them. So now that we have the change, uh, uh, the change in value for the gradient and the y-intercept, we can finally optimize or update the values for the gradient and the y-intercept. So we, we take the current values of the gradient and the y-intercept, and we subtract that change in error from it, and we multiply that change in error with something called the learning rate. In machine learning, it's denoted by this variable called alpha or eta. But here, for simplicity's sake, since most of us are familiar with alpha, we'll use alpha. So what alpha does is it decides the extent to which, or extent by which, the values are updated. So we can use this formula, where the new values of the gradient and y-intercept are the current values of m and c subtracted uh, and we subtract the, the change, dj, dm, and D, uh, dj, dc, which is basically the derivatives of m and c with respect to the loss. And we multiply it to the alpha learning rate, which basically shows us the proportion of the current values that's supposed to be overwritten in the next round. And if we were to convert this again into simple Python, uh, we get the derivatives using that function we wrote earlier, get derivatives, uh, where we get the values of dc and dm. Uh, we update them. We update the next round of values with the current values. Uh, subtract, uh, we subtract the, the change from the current values, and we return the, the better values of, or optimized values of c and m. So if we were to do a progress check, uh, I understand that uh, uh, most of you may be still confused with the math, but as we write the code, it may be clearer as to what exactly we're doing. And uh, we'll be writing these helper functions along, along the way in the live coding session that we'll be doing now. And uh, yeah, let's perform linear regression now. So we, uh, using these functions that we've learned uh, in this first part of the workshop, we initially ran, uh, create, get random values for the gradient and y-intercept. We plot the line, find the error, as in we find how off the line is compared to the real values. We find the gradient or the change in the loss function where the error is the minimum, and we update it with, uh, we update the parameters, uh, the gradient and y-intercept, m and c, with that change. And finally, we can redraw the line. And uh, of course, the line is going to be much closer to the best fit line. 
And finally, if we were to sum all of that up into the final linear regression function, we take in the values of x and y that we're trying to find a linear relationship to. We randomly initialize the values of c and m as shown by the first two lines of the function here. Alpha, we set it to a really low value. Not too low that it makes the algorithm too slow in learning the val optimal values of m and c, but not too large enough that it takes uh, even longer time because it just keeps bouncing back and forth the optimal values. And the number of rounds or iterations will set it to 1,000. So we hope that by 1,000 rounds, we're able to get values that are close to the perfect values or the optimal values of MNC. <coughs> so using the update parameters function that we wrote earlier, uh, we give in the learning rate x, y, c, and m. And by the end of these 1,000 steps, uh, it'll keep repeating and keep optimizing these values of the gradient and y-intercept such that by the end of the algorithm, we can plot a line that's basically the best fit line or something that's close to it. Okay, uh, now we'll be doing the live coding session. Okay, so uh, do all of you or most of you have internet connection? Uh, if you don't, please raise your hands. Okay, yeah. Uh, we'll start in two minutes. Please do configure the Wi-Fi because uh, we'll be using uh, something online. But so far, does anyone have any questions or any doubts as to what's happening here? No? Okay. Uh, does anyone still not have internet connection? Okay, so uh, I'm assuming that all of us are connected. So yeah, now it's, uh, okay, yeah, it's coding time. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming that m all of you have a Google Drive account or a Gmail account. So uh, please go to this website, drive.google.com. Uh, basically access your Google Drive, please. Anyone not on the drive site yet? Okay, everyone's in, right? Okay, so when you're in your Google Drive, uh, click the new button and you'll get this drop down menu. You'll see this drop down menu, uh, and at the bottom of the drop down menu, you'll see this option called More. And if you hover over More, you'll get this other second drop down menu where you'll see this thing that says Collaboratory. Uh, it has this CO uh, icon or logo. Uh, yeah, in some cases, you may not have the, uh, the Collaboratory app. Uh, but you can download it. I think in Google Drive, when you uh, go to the uh, drop-down menu, you can actually download apps that you can put on to Google Drive. So um, it'll open a pop-up window, and you can search Collaboratory or Colab. Uh, it's spelled C-O-L-A-B. Uh, I think if you type the first five letters, you can probably get the... Uh, anyone who didn't find it yet? Uh, this side is, is everyone clear? Is everyone, okay. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Again, if you haven't connected to the Wi-Fi so far, please do because we'll be coding on uh, an online platform. 
At the end of the workshop, I'll be open sourcing all of this on GitHub, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, I'll give you the contact details and my account so that you can check out these slides, as well as the Colab notebook uh, for future reference. Yeah. Uh, It'll be better if you can do this on a laptop because we'll actually be writing some code. Okay then. Just give me a second. Uh, does everyone see this on their screen, right? Uh, anyone still unclear? Okay. Just give me a second. Uh, hold on, sir. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, it's uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, this is the app. Yeah. Uh, so you've downloaded it, right? Yeah. So if you have you added the app, you click. Uh, anyone not clear, please do raise your hand. Uh, anyone else? Okay then, uh, let's code. Okay, uh, let me just increase the font size. Can, uh, can everyone see this? Can the back row see this? Or uh, how about this? Uh, the back row can see this, right? Okay, pause, can? So what you've currently just opened is this thing called Collaboratory Notebooks. Uh, it's this online coding environment that is spe specifically meant for machine learning. Anyone can access it and it's free. And best of all, if you're doing some really cool projects that may be intensive in terms of computational power, they can actually give you a provision of free cloud GPU for 12 hours. Uh, so yeah, that, that's pretty cool. So what we'll be doing is uh, a notebook is basically a, a cell-based uh, editor where you can actually type code in cells and you can run individual cells. It's great for visualizing things and uh, uh, for interactive presentations. Okay, so, <laughs> so first off, we'll start off by importing all the libraries that we need. So... Okay, please make sure that you are connected uh, to the server. So you just need to click the connect button if you're not connected. And if you are connected, it'll show connected and it'll show you some memory usage. Okay, everyone good so far? Okay, everyone's connected. Okay, <coughs> excuse me. So for this specific example, we'll be using a few Python libraries or packages that come pre-installed when you're using Colab, 
right? And that's the cool part because machine learning, you need to have all these weird sorts of libraries and modules, but what Colab does is it has it all pre-installed, so you just need to call it and you can use it. So we'll be using this library called NumPy. Has anyone heard of NumPy before? Okay, great. So NumPy, for those of you who don't know, it's this library or module that enables us to do numerical computing. So anything to do with vectors, differentiation, uh, anything to do with matrices or matrix operations, uh, NumPy is your go-to library. Uh, next, we'll be uh, importing this thing called matplotlib. Anyone who's heard of matplotlib? Okay. So what matplotlib does, uh, we use this pyplot uh, submodule from the matplotlib library, and this enables us to draw graphs. So uh, this enables, uh, enables us to uh, give really cool presentations and visualizations by drawing colorful charts either in 2D or 3D. And you can even uh, show images on this, which is pretty cool. Okay, so to run, to run a cell, there's this play button over here, and when you click play, it'll actually compile the code that you've written in that specific cell for which you wrote, where you click play for. So now we can see that uh, the code has run, and uh, does anyone have any errors so far? Everyone's cool, right? Okay, sorry? Okay, okay, great. Okay, so there's this button called code, and when you click it, it'll give you a new cell. So that's another interesting fact about Colab. You can just keep adding cells and run them individually. Uh, and uh, it actually uses the variables that you declared in previous cells above. So you don't need to run the entire thing again and again. You can just run cell after cell because it's all dependent on what you've already ran above. So when, when we start off with uh, linear regression, we, well, we need data, right? So for now, we'll be creating some dummy data before we apply our algorithm to something, uh, <coughs> to like a real life data set, like the iris classification data set. Uh, so, okay, yeah. So, <coughs> so we need the X and Y, and to create them, uh, NumPy comes with this uh, sub-module that allows you to uh, create, uh, well, random digits. Hold on. So it can either create random digits or it can actually create variables for you or randomly initialized data values for you that you can actually plot on a graph. So if you type this thing called uh, x equals, uh, hold on. Yeah, uh, so what this lin space uh, submodule does is it basically creates a linear space, and a linear space is basically continuous values from say uh, one to a hundred. So what we're what we're trying to declare here is uh, we want values from one to hundred, and we can do the same for y. So usually in machine learning. Uh, we denote x and y, x with the capital uh, with the capital X and y with a small x. It's just for notation simplicity. Okay, and again, if we were to run this, yep, it ran. So now, if I were to actually print these values of right, uh, click play, and uh, yeah, so basically all it gave me were just random values from one to 100 or in the range one to 100. So this allows you for quick prototyping. If you just want to test out your algorithm, its performance on a random data set, you can actually create a random data set with just this uh, linear space variable. Okay, so uh, okay, uh, we ran this. Okay. 
And for a line, we need random values for M and C, right? So, okay, so if we were to actually print the values of M and C, so at the beginning, I told you that linear regression assumes that the, the, the values of the gradient m and the y-intercept are completely random. It is going to result in a horrible best fit line. Uh, so if we run this, yeah, we just get two random values of m and c. And next, since we have the m, x, uh, m, x, c, and y, well, let's plot the line. So let's write this helper function called plot line. So it takes in m, c, uh, and well, uh, x, and y. <laughs> so for reference, I've already written this function to save time. So uh, yeah, this is the function. Hold on, let me just copy this. Okay, yeah. So we're using the PyPlot's uh, graphing capabilities. So given the values of, uh, yeah, given the values of the gradient, y-intercept, x and y, we can actually plot these values. And uh, let's call the plot line function for our random values. So what this will do, uh, we're calling the plot line function below over here, uh, yeah, over here. And what it does is basically takes our values and converts it to a line. So if we, to, we were to run this function, hold on. So uh, this function, uh, we're just experimenting with different values to show how off the line is. So as you can see from here, our points are all uh, represented by these blue dots. And sorry? Uh, yeah, hold on. So if you were to run that cell, we can see that uh, the, the line we plotted is pretty off from what we're supposed to get. It's not line space, it's L I N. There's no E. It's not line, it's lin. Am I using it? Uh, hold on, let me just scroll up so you can get the code. So over here, we're just taking these values that we gave the function, and we're plotting this on a graph. 
uh, we're scattering, we're creating a scatter plot for the points that we created above, uh, the x and y points that we created above. And we are drawing a line and we're labeling it the linear regression line. Uh, does everyone have the code now? Uh, if you haven't finished copying it, please do raise your hands. Okay, yeah. So the 1,000 is basically, what it does is it creates a larger range for the graph to be shown. So we have a rough idea of how off the line is. Is anyone still copying the code? For every time you randomly initialize M and C, X and Y, it'll keep giving you a different graph or a different line for all of them, which shows that uh, linear regression starts off with random variables and optimizes them as we gradually move along the rounds. Okay, is anyone still writing the code? Okay, so uh, I'm assuming that everyone's written the code uh, and ran the cell. Uh, who doesn't see the graph yet? Everyone should have a graph by running the code, right? And we can see that this red line over here, it's really off from what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be something close uh, to these blue dots, which are basically represented, which basically represent your points. So. These are the current values for M and C, and through the process of linear regression, we'll try to get these such that it represents the best fit line for these uh, set of points over here. Okay, so the next process is uh, we, at the start, I mentioned that we follow the hypothesis function, which is basically a set of rule, it's a rule or a guideline that we follow such that we optimize values for, for it. So here we're defining a function called the hypothesis function. Yeah, and we 
basically return the mx plus c. Yeah. Okay, is everyone good to go? Okay. So next, we want to create this function that represents this math formula here, which is our loss function. So the loss function, again, a, a fresher. Uh, the loss function, what it does is it takes our line and it compares it with the current line and sees how off our predictions are with what it's supposed to be. So in that function on the slide, we initialize this value called total loss to be zero. And through the process, we are going to iterate through. Uh, we're going to iterate, and we're going to find the average loss for that one round that we're running this for. So for. So what this line does is, in the math formula, we saw that it's represented by xi and yi, right? So xi and yi represent a single training example in our whole data set. So say I have a data set comprising of cat and dog images, right? So one image, you know, it could be a cat or dog, whatever it is, that represents a single training example in our data set. And in machine learning, we call this a training instance. So, and it's represented by xi and yi. And uh, similarly, we're taking, we're iterating through the inter entirety of the x and y values, our data set, and we're looking at it example by example, or instance by instance. And we use a hypothesis function that we wrote earlier we pass in the values of m, c, and x. So the next part of the formula is uh, getting getting the difference between <coughs> getting the difference between our line and the real values. So I'm sorry, this is supposed to be x i because we're calculating the hypothesis function for that one specific example. So next, we, we'll, we'll create a variable called diff or difference. So what this does is it basically takes the difference between our line minus what it's supposed to be. Next, in the formula, we have the squaring of this difference. And what we'll do is we'll call this the square is equal to numpy dot square. So earlier I mentioned that NumPy is used for numerical computing. One cool thing about NumPy is that it provides all these functions, math functions like absolute, square root, square, power, such that we can, uh, you, we can take numbers and we can perform these kind of arithmetic operations on them really easily. And we pass in the value of the difference. Next, after we have the square, we want to take the sum of we want to take the sum of that difference, right? So in the slides, we have this sigma notation over here that over these instances, we take the sum of all of them. So we'll call this the summation. I'm not calling this sum because sum is a reserved keyword in Python. And we have the numpy function of np.sum of the square. Uh, has everyone written the code for this so far? If I'm going too fast, please do tell me. Uh, I can slow down. And now we have the average. 
which is basically 1 divided by 2 times m. m over here is the length of x, or basically the number of examples in our training set. So if the length of x is 100, that means we have 100 instances in our training set. And we multiply this again with our summation. I mean, more than average, we can actually call this the error itself or the loss. Because at this point in time, we've uh, successfully taken this math formula and converted it into simple four lines of code. So all these four lines of code actually represent our error for this one specific training example. And now we can finally add this or append this to the total loss variable. And then we can finally return our total loss. Okay, so uh, are we good to go? Okay. So we run this cell and we create another cell. So up next, we actually have to find the partial derivative of the loss function so that we perform this process called gradient descent as I'd mentioned earlier. So we've, take, we've written this loss function and now we perform this. <laughs> so Again, we find the derivatives with respect to the gradient and the y-intercept. And we can convert this again into simple Python with this. So we define a function called get derivatives. We pass in the values of the gradient, the y-intercept, our x values, and y values. And then we initialize our uh, derivative with respect to C and our derivative respect to M as zero. And just like the loss function over here, we denote M as the number of training instances in our data set. Yep. Again, we want to take this change and we want to uh, uh, change all the values. So again, we want to be consistent across our whole data set, which is why, again, we will be iterating through all the instances in our data set. So the zip function is a reserved keyword in Python, which basically combines two arrays. So it actually uh, puts them column by column together, such that it becomes one big or mega array comprising of two smaller arrays. And you can iterate through each training instance or each set of values uh, separately in this zipped array. So again, we get the hypothesis function. We use it to get our f of x, which is basically our line. So the hypothesis function, as we have written here, it takes in the values of our gradient, the y-intercept, and the x of i, which is basically the, the i-th index of the training instance. And if we take reference to the formulas over here, <laughs> we take the sum of all the, the partial derivatives, uh, and we take the average of them. So again, if we were to convert this into simple Python, we can say dc, the derivative with respect to c, it is fx minus yi, as denoted by that formula. And d, dm is fx minus yi multiplied to xi. So if you were to actually do the math, the partial differentiation for the loss function with respect to both the variables C and M, you'd get this formula over here. And we're representing the, these two equations in Python.
So the next step is, uh, since we're doing this for one training example, we don't need to take the sum for this. Uh, so what we need to do next is we need to take the average of it across all training examples. So we can do this with a simple slash equals to, which uh, dis divides, which divides the value, all the values present in the DC and DM array uh, by M, which is the number of training iterations. And then we return them and we run it. Uh, in the meantime, let me go get my laptop charger. If you have any questions or doubts with the output you're getting, please do ask. So that's not the error. Uh, so hold on, let me just uh, pull up. Excuse me for a moment, I'll be scrolling up to the plot function because some of you may have not caught the exact functions. Okay, so uh, <coughs> I understand some of you uh, have arrived late, so I'll just do a recap so that even those who have been with us, uh, you can get uh, a rough idea of where the code is going and our progress. <coughs> so uh, we start off with importing the libraries NumPy and Matplotlib, NumPy for numerical computation and Matplotlib for the uh, the graph drawing and the curves. Uh, we have the X and Y data set, which is uh, random values in the range of one to 100. Uh, so it's represented by capital X and lowercase y. And next we randomly initialize the values of the gradient and the y-intercept. Uh, by using the numpy.random.randn, which basically gives two values uh, which are randomly initialized based on your computer's specification. Next up, uh, we have the plot line function, which takes in our values of the gradient, a y-intercept, x and y, and we plot a line. <coughs> so if I were to run all of this, So we can see these blue dots are the points that we're trying to create the best line for, best fit line for. And this red line over here, it is our line or our estimate using these random values. We can see that it's really off, uh, showing that linear regression starts off with a random line, randomly drawn, and how we're gonna optimize it in such a way that by the end of this linear regression function, it'll create something that's close to the best fit line for these blue points, okay. Next, we have the hypothesis function, which is basically our guideline or rule that we're trying to follow. It creates a linear relationship, or it assumes a linear relationship between the variables x and y. Uh, we'll run this. So after we, get, after we plot the line, uh, we wanna see how off the prediction is. So we have this thing called the loss function, which basically takes the difference between our line and the line or the value that it's supposed to be our prediction and what the real value of y should be. And it uh, uses the loss formula of, 
or the loss function formula of this. And if we uh, change this to simple Python, we calculate the hypothesis function or our prediction. We get the difference of fx minus yi, which is basically our line minus what it's supposed to be. We square the difference using the pre-built numpy.square function. And we sum all these errors together. And we take the average of this error. And then finally, we add it to the total loss variable. And we return this loss. And we'll run this. And this get derivatives function, what we're doing is we're translating this change in error where the error value is the, is the minimum. So when you take the derivative of something and equate it to zero, the variables that are dependent of, on it, such as the gradient and y-intercept, are the most optimal values when the error is zero. So we change this to simple Python, and we get this function where we calculate the prediction or fx. And using this formula of fx minus yi and fx minus yi times xi, uh, if you do the math, you can actually get these formulas. But for uh, uh, time's sake, we'll uh, just end it at this. And then d, uh, we calculate the derivatives with respect to c and m, take the average, and we return them. OK, so uh, that's a quick recap of what we've written so far, because some of you uh, uh, entered late. Uh, so this is a general recap. So after we get the derivatives, the next step is, well, to update the values of m and c. So we move on, and we use our update formula of m equals m minus alpha, uh, alpha multiplied to the respective derivatives uh, with respect to c and m. And we, when we convert this to Python, we so if we convert this to Python, we can define a function called update parameters. Which basically takes in the values of m, c, x, y, and earlier I mentioned that we use this thing called the learning rate. The learning rate, uh, it shows us or it tells us how quickly the the algorithm is going to converge to the optimal values. So when I say converge, it basically means through rounds of iteration or through the rounds of drawing the line, seeing how off we are, and correcting that error margin, we can actually get the alpha value, value actually dictates how fast we're going to get there or how slow we're going to get there. So sometimes choosing the right or the perfect or the optimal alpha value is really important when doing linear regression because that because the speed of learning it well depends on alpha. So if we were to take reference to this formula again, if we convert this to code, using this get derivatives for a, a function above, we return the values of d, c, and d, m, and we can call this function. And we pass in the values of m, c, x, and y, a gradient, y-intercept, x, and y points. And then we can finally use the update rule, or the update policy, or the update equation, uh, to, ca to get the, the next round of values for, al for the gradient and the y-intercept. So alpha times dm. And c equals to c minus alpha times dc. And then, after this, we basically return the values of m and c. So through rounds of linear regression, or through iterations or epochs, we can see that the values of m and c get closer and closer to the values that they're supposed to be. As in, they become really close to giving us the best fit line. So after the update parameter function has been written, well, the next step is to perform linear regression. So all these functions above, the hypothesis function, loss function, get derivatives function, and the update parameters function, all of these were basically the helper function that's going to aid us in finally writing our linear regression algorithm.
So again, we give it the values of m, c, sorry. So linear regression, since it's the final function, we just need to pass in x and y because the values of m and c, they are created internally in this function. So if we were to take reference with the code, we can see that m and c, uh, the first two lines, yeah, the first two lines, we create random values for them. Uh, in this case, we're multiplying 0 0.01 to them so as to ensure that uh, the values remain small and easy to calculate with because when you have two large values or really big values, your computer is going to overflow because it can't compute uh, with that large of a number. So again, we create random variables using the pre-built np.random.randn. So this gives us two random values for the y-intercept and the gradient. So now that we've initialized the random values of m and c, next step is to create, is to initialize the alpha or the learning rate, which basically dictates or shows how fast the algorithm's gonna be in learning the relationship between x and y. So here we're gonna set it to something really low like 0 0.05. So usually alpha values are set to something small so that uh, they can converge faster rather than having a really large value where it keeps ba bouncing back and forth between the optimal value. So supposing that the uh, optimal value is two, so it'll keep jumping from one to three multiple times or zero to four multiple times until it finally converges to two. But if we have something like 0 0.05, we can probably jump from 1.5 to 2.5 and, and then finally converge at 2. So learning is much smoother, it's faster, and more efficient. So up next is the number of rounds. And the number of rounds basically denotes the number of iterations or epochs that this thing's gonna run for, or the algorithm's gonna run for. So by the end of 1,000 rounds, we hope that our algorithm is able to get a decent value for M and C and can optimize it such that it's able to give us something that's close to the best fit line. So again, we iterate through these different values, through these num rounds, or through these epochs, and we hope that by 1,000 rounds, we can get MNC that's gonna give us the best fit line. <coughs> so CNM, we can get it using this update parameters function which basically gives us the values of M and C and returns it. So for this update uh, parameters, we give it the gradient, the y-intercept, x, y, and our learning rate alpha, such that it's able to get calculate the next value of M that's closer to the optimal values by using that formula that was shown earlier. And then, after that, we can basically return M and C. So by the end of this training loop, we call this thing the training loop, or the training job, or the training cycle. We hope that the values of M and C have converged to the optimal values of what they're supposed to be. And then we can return M and C. Remember this plot line function that we'd written earlier? What we can do is we can call this plot line function in our linear regression algorithm just after we've initialized these random values for M and C, just to give us a rough idea of how off the line is when we first start off. And then what we can do is after this training job or training cycle, we can actually plot it again so this shows us if the line has improved at all. Okay, yeah. And for simplicity's sake, or for greater visualization or detail, we can actually print out these initial values of M and C, 
and we can print the final values of M and C after this entire process has ended. So, yeah. So this is the code for the final linear regression algorithm. So what it does is it takes the values of X and Y, our data set, and uh, assigns it random values of M and C. And by the end of the training cycle, we optimize these values to get something that's better at giving us the best fit line. Okay, yeah. Uh, silly mistake on my part. Uh, in the update parameters function in the linear regression, uh, in the linear regression formula, uh, above we returned M and C. It's supposed to be M and C here as well. We don't want to confuse the values of both of them. So then, after writing all of this, all the helper functions, we've converted math into code. We can finally call linear regression of x and y that we initialized over here in this cell. So now it is the moment of truth. All these functions that we have written above all these contribute to the final linear regression formula or the linear regression algorithm to optimize this line. So let's run this. Hopefully the M and C values are able to get optimized. So we can see a horribly drawn line over here with values, uh, with these values of M and C. And with, well, we see that the values of M and C have improved in some way through 1,000 iterations. We can see that this line is not the best fit line clearly because it doesn't really, is, it is not really parallel to these blue points here. It shows us that the, either the number of rounds of iteration is not enough, so either we need to pump it up to, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000, or that the values of M and C are really small. So we can play around with these values of M and C such that they give us values that we can optimize further within these 1,000 rounds. So here we get something that's almost close to the best fit line. So what this does, it, what, so when we initially randomize these variables for MNC, we get a really horrible line. And by the end of 1,000 iterations or 1,000 rounds, we can get something that's closer to the points that we plotted. And we can even see that the values of the MNC have changed from what they previously were, which shows us that the linear regression algorithm is doing something to optimize these values. So for some of you, it may work, and for some of you, it may not, probably because of the internal state of your machine. Because when we initialize random variables on a computer, it, uh, it's unique for each computer. So your line may be different from the person sitting next to you, which is why some of the values that were randomly assigned may not were assigned here may not be fully ref reflective of the true capabilities of the linear regression algorithm. Because in the slide uh, that I showed you, this was a visualization of linear regression uh, where we take in the x and y variables, and we can see that it's supposed to be doing this. So this is the true representative of the linear regression function such that it optimizes M and C uh, to give us something that's close to the best fit line. Okay, due to time constraints, I will be moving a bit faster. Uh, hopefully it's not too much of a trouble. Okay, so now that we've, uh, we've uh, performed linear regression, and some of us, or most of us, have the bare bones concept of linear regression and how it works. We'll be moving on to this th uh, thing called the single layer perceptron. So it comes from the root word percept, which basically means think 
or has the ability to think. So single layer, because it, uh, I'll be showing you later on, it consists of a single nonlinear function in it, which is able to give us a better representation of the data set. And linear regression in this form, in the most basic form, it can only take in one value of x for the next value of y, or for a corresponding value of x and y. But in single layer perceptrons, it can take in multiple values of x, which we call features, right? So for a flower, we have multiple features. You know, it's the length of its stalk, the length of, length of its uh, petal, the width of its petal. And uh, we can use all these attributes or features or characteristics of the flower to predict what type of flower it is. Uh, but before I uh, begin, uh, Okay, it might be a problem because my charger can't fit in. Um, okay. Okay, so linear regression, it assumed a linear relationship between the variables x and y. So what single layer perceptrons do is it assumes a nonlinear relationship between x and y. So linear relationships are restricted in the kinds of mappings they can do between those two variables because, well, we're only confined to a line. But a curve can have any kind of shape and form, which makes it really flexible in giving us an ideal or more than ideal uh, mapping or representation or relationship between x and y. So as mentioned in the slides, we can get the best fit curve for the data using a nonlinear method such as a single layer perceptron. But before we begin, uh, the inspiration for a single layer perceptron came from the biological neuron in the human brain. So what it does is it gets information from the neurons around it, it processes that information, and it sends it outwards to other neurons nearby. So it gets in information from other neurons, processes it, and sends it out the other end. So the computational version or the mathematical model that, we, that scientists or researchers try to give to this biological neuron was the single layer perceptron neuron. So when I say single layer, it means that there's only one function or a single function that we're, that we're performing between X and Y to get the relationship between them. So as I said, it can take in multiple inputs. So X1 all the way to Xn. So if we were to consider flowers, such as the iris flowers, we can have something like the width of the stalk, the width and length of the petal. And all of these can be individual numbers or attributes or features that we can pass into the single layer perceptron. And we can get the final prediction to see whether either it's iris setosa or iris virginica. In this, <coughs> in this workshop, we'll be looking at a single layer perceptron where it gives us multiple predictions and the prediction with the highest probability of occurring is the one that the uh, inputs most likely denote. So if I gave in multiple features as my x values, it would give me the different probabilities of y1, y2, and y3, which are basically predictions. And the one with the highest value among y1, y2, and y3 is, well, basically it shows us what it is. So if one type of flower was Y1, another type Y2, and Y3 was another type of flower. Say that at the end of this entire training loop and cycle, we get that Y2 is the value with the highest amongst Y1, 2, and 3. We can say that the flower that we gave it, it belongs to the second type of flower. So what it does is it takes in these attributes or features. It performs the summation function, uh, which is the same as we did in linear regression. And it performs this thing called the activation function, which I'll be uh, showing you later on. And it gives multiple outputs, y1 to y3, or depending on your use case. And the one with the highest value it, or the highest probability is the one uh, that the input belongs to or corresponds to. The fun thing about uh, <laughs> single layer perceptrons is that we only need the gradient to optimize. We can completely ignore the y-intercept, which makes this more efficient compared to uh, 
linear regression because in linear regression we're only we're, we're trying to optimize two values but in single layer perceptrons we are optimizing just one gradient value so in single layer perceptrons we'll be working with vectors and matrices so at the start in this slide I showed you that it can take in multiple inputs right so these multiple inputs can be represented as a single vector so a vector is a single dimensional matrix so it's an n times one dimensional matrix you can assume it to be a column of values one after another which denote different things like the petal width or the petal length so we perform the summation function on the different attributes. We multiply it with the corresponding values of M. Uh, we don't need C because, as I said, that's the key that makes single layer perceptrons more efficient. And we perform the activation function on it. So what exactly is an activation function? The activation function is something that introduces non-linearity. So initially I said that the initial relationship that the single layer perceptron assumes is y equals mx, right? But that's linear in some way. Uh, what the activation function does is it converts that y equals mx into something non-linear. So it takes uh, the linear relationship, applies a random function or the activation function on it such that the model is able to find even more patterns in the data, which is basically the task of machine learning. So in this uh, workshop, we'll be using this uh, activation function called sigmoid. So the sigmoid function, it, whenever it takes in an input, it performs this computation or this calculation on the x input such that it's able to squash any number, any size, into a number between 0 and 1. So if you have a calculator with you now, you can just key in this formula. And for x, you can put in any value. It'll give you something between 0 and 1. And in probability theory, we can assume a probability of an event occurring as something between 0 and 1, right? So if there's something that's close to 1, we can say that there's a high probability or high chance of it occurring. And if it's something close to 0, we can say that it's probably not going to happen. So again, finding the errors in prediction. The fun fact about single layer perceptrons is that it follows the same uh, loss function as the linear regression which is basically this uh, math formula that was shown earlier. So what happens next is we take this, the same values of the partial derivatives, but in single layer perceptrons, we perform this thing called backpropagation, which is a step of taking these values of M and C, taking their derivatives and passing them uh, back up the chain over here. So when we give a prediction, we take in the values, and we bring it out from left to right. But in Bragg propagation, it calculates the derivatives of the value of m, and it sends it back through using differentiation. And this way, it's, you can think of it as a blame game. So the final prediction blames the activation function for being wrong. The activation function blames the y equals mx formula for being wrong. And then through this whole blame game or process, we can find who exactly or which step is giving the wrong value, and we can optimize the value at that specific position, which is what backpropagation does. But for, again, t uh, uh, time uh, issues, we'll not be covering backpropagation. And uh, we'll just do a, okay, hold on, I think my battery died. Uh, can I get some help over here? The charger's not fitting into the plug point here. Uh, is there an adapter? So single layer perceptrons and linear regression models, they're really similar in some aspects, but in other aspects, they may be slightly different, which shows the difference in performance. If you were to use a neural network such as a single layer perceptron, and you use a basic traditional algorithm such as linear regression, we can see lots of differences in its performance, accuracy, precision, and everything that gives it its final form. Hold on. Okay, great. So if we were to do a final study on 
single layer perceptrons and linear regression. Yeah, we can see that both of them assume a partial or semi uh, true relationship of y equals mx or a linear uh, relationship. Both of them compute the errors or the change in errors using the loss function. Both of, you, both of them use some form of gradient descent. In single layer perceptrons, we use backpropagation, but in linear regression, we use gradient descent. But invariably, they both do the same thing of passing the error from the prediction to the functions that gave it the value. And the differences is that linear regression uh, works with just single values, but in this case, in single layer perceptrons, you can pass in multiple inputs, making them more versatile for many use cases. And single layer perceptrons apply activation functions, which introduces non-linearity to the model. And since, since curves have more flexibility, we can see that they are able to find better patterns in the data and can give more accurate predictions. So now, let's code a single layer perceptron. So in the linear regression, we saw how math heavy it was. And most researchers, they don't have that kind of time to write the individual helper functions and those, convert those formulas to code, which is why developers uh, in many companies, such as Google uh, and Facebook, they created these open source machine learning libraries. So what they do is all these formulas and helper functions it just squashes it so that your entire machine learning code can be converted to just a few lines of machine learning, uh, machine learning scripts. So now what we'll be doing is we'll be using a machine, one such machine learning uh, library where we're going to build sing, uh, a single layer perceptron. We'll be pre-processing the data uh, beforehand. So what the problem with machine learning is that a machine learning engineer or technician usually uh, spends about 80% of that time uh, wrangling with the data, spends lots of his time you know, cleaning, dusting, and you know, cleansing it such that he can spend 20% of his time feeding it into the model. And now, we'll actually be using one such machine learning library. Some of you may think it's scikit-learn if you've heard of it, but no, we'll be using TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is this open source machine learning framework uh, it was released about three, four years back. Uh, and version 2.0 just released last week at the TensorFlow Dev Summit, which makes this even more exciting because uh, TensorFlow is up and coming. It'd be great if you'd get a hands-on experience with using it because nowadays most machine learning projects and research projects are using TensorFlow or some form of TensorFlow. Uh, or abstractions over TensorFlow for these projects, making it allowing for quick prototyping, uh, experimentation. You can just write a bunch of code, few lines of code. You can have an entire suite of machine learning tools at your disposal. If you want to read more about TensorFlow and its applications in the real world, you can visit the website tensorflow.org, and you can get hands-on code labs, such as the ones that I've shown you. Uh, and you can get uh, hands-on examples of different real-life use cases, data sets that you can play with. Uh, yeah, all of it's available at tensorflow.org. So now we'll be using TensorFlow to predict the flower type. Okay, so flower type, as I said, it can consist, uh, in this workshop, we'll be taking two kinds of iris flowers, setosa and virginica. We'll be using these uh, features, the sepal length, width, petal length, and width, and uh, we'll ta be taking these four attributes and we'll be predicting the type given a new data set or given a new training example that the model has never seen. So in the case that we take our model today and we were going to release it online so that anyone can give it different values of length and width variables, we can actually predict what kind of flower it's gonna be or what type of flower it's gonna be. So for the data set, uh, can you all please visit this uh, tiny URL link? So capital F, capital A, IRIS, SLP, all caps. So what this should do is, uh, hold on, let me just connect to the internet again.
Okay, so you should be seeing something like this. Does everyone have something like this? Yeah, so this is the data set we're gonna use. But you don't need to download it. We'll just be automatically downloading it within Colab. So one thing that's cool about Colab is it allows you to perform command line uh, functions uh, inside one of the cells. If you put an exclamation mark in front of it, uh, you can basically do command line functions on it. So you can either use the same Colab that we used for the linear regression example, but for just to keep it clean, I'll create a new one just for the single layer perceptron. Okay. So, okay, so let me just close this. Okay. So again, if you do not know how to access a Colab notebook, you can go to your Google Drive, log in using your Gmail account, really simple. Uh, you can click the new button. In the drop down menu, you'll see this thing called more. And if you were to click on more again, you can get this other drop down link. And you'll see this thing called collaboratory with the icon or logo of CO. Uh, everyone's able to access a Colab notebook, right? Okay, great. Okay, so I have my Colab notebook up and running, and let me just connect it. Okay, so in this uh, uh, page that you see, uh, just copy this link over here. So the link over there that leads to this page, just copy it. Uh, we, you don't need to actually download this onto your physical machine or local machine. So what you can do is you can do exclamation mark, wget. So what wget does is it's a function that allows you to download content off the internet without actually having to download it locally. And then with that uh, URL, you just paste it. So that long link, just paste it with the wget, exclamation wget in front of it. And if you were to run this, you can actually download that entire thing. Yep, it's downloaded. And it, uh, it's called the iris slp.csv. Uh, additionally, if you are not really familiar with uh, command line functions, you, could, uh, you can import this library called pandas. So what pandas allows you to do uh, is you can work with uh, data sets, you can make, you can form tables with them, allows for really easy visualization and representation of your data. So, so pandas comes with the built-in pd.readcsv function. Okay, so read CSV, and you can actually dump in this link over here, and it'll actually read that uh, online URL link. And, uh, what we'll be doing next is converting this data set into a data frame. So what a data frame is, is you can assume it to be an Excel spreadsheet. So we're converting that raw content that you saw, these number, these values, and their flower types. We'll actually be converting it into something that looks uh, uh, and works like an Excel spreadsheet, which makes it so much easier because I'm assuming that most of us have worked with Excel before and we know that we can uh, easily manipulate data from that. So you can actually print the first few uh, training examples on from that data set by typing dataset.head. So let's see if this works. Okay, it turns out that the download link doesn't work. In the case that you're not using a Colab notebook, you can use the pandas alternative to doing that. But since, the, since Colab comes with this method that automatically downloads it, we'll just use this. Okay, so again, we'll import pandas as pd, and we'll call this a data set. And over here in your download link, you should see something called iris slp.csv. CSV stands for comma separated values. So uh, as you can see, all these values here, 
they are separated by commas. And you can, after each comma, you can assume it to be something like an Excel sheet. So a comma is basically one cell in the Excel sheet. So we can say uh, PD or pandas dot read CSV iris slp dot CSV. So since Colab has already downloaded this uh, link for us, we can actually use it off the bat. Yep. So now we have successfully loaded our data set into Colab, right? So again, as I mentioned earlier, machine learning technicians and machine learning engineers, those who work with ML on a daily basis, most of that time goes into doing stuff like this, opening or loading data sets, seeing if there are missing values, patching up errors in the data sets if something's wrong, and only a small bit of time is actually is spent creating the model, training the model. So yeah, now that we have successfully, uh, now that we've successfully created our data set, uh, run this. Yeah, so as we can see, it looks like something off an Excel sheet, you know, where each of these are the individual columns and cells. And we can see that we're using the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width to predict the final type of the flower. So let's create another cell. So what we'll be doing now is, since we have the data set, we need to convert it into something that the, co that the algorithm can read, right? So So the pandas data frame comes with this built-in function called dataset.values, which just basically converts all of this into an array that we can use. So if we were to create another thing called features, so when I say features, it basically refers to these values such as sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And they are the attributes that describe the flower type. So So over here, we're saying that we want all the columns, which is denoted by this colon over here. Comma states that we're moving on to the next axis, which is basically the column axis. And when we say colon four, we're trying to say that we want everything until the fourth column, or before the fourth column. So in, well, in Python programming, indexing starts from zero, right? So we're moving from zero, one, two, three, four, right? So we have zero, we have zero, one, two, three, four. And in this function, we're just saying we want everything before four. And then we can create another variable called labels, which is basically minus one. So what minus one does is it basically just gets that last column. If you have a really long set of columns or a large number of columns, if you do, minus one, it just basically gets that last column. And the colon basically says, yeah, we want the, all the rows or all these 100 training samples or examples. And now if we were to print features, <laughs> if we were to print the first uh, example in our features data set, yep, it corresponds to the values over here, 5.1, 3.5, 1.4, and 0 0.2. And we could do the same for, so we could do the same for the labels and it'll, gener it'll just return iris setosa. So now that, now that we have the features, we can finally import NumPy because we're finally getting into the exciting part. We're gonna create we're gonna transform the data such that it's accessible or usable by our machine learning algorithm. So features, again, we can call it np.array. So it takes np.array or numpy.array takes in a regular array and creates the numpy version of it, which basically means that it's good for ca uh, computation, we can do anything with it. And let me just feed in the features variable. But since labels are text values, are iris virginica or iris setosa, we need to do a bit more pre-processing. So we can actually iterate through the labels.
And we can say that if the labels, if the ith index in the labels is equal to iris satosa, then, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, above this, we can create this empty array called y, which is basically our x and y variables, this is y. So if it sees iris satosa, we can append the array one, zero. So this one, zero notation, we call this thing one hot encoding in machine learning. So one hot means that if we have multiple classes or multiple types that we're predicting, the, whenever it's a one, it shows that it belongs to that type. So if it sees something like iris setosa, we're just saying out of the two, out of the two categories of flowers that it can belong to, uh, when it sees this, these kind of values for the petal and sepal lengths and widths, we are assigning it to be the iris setosa. So one and zero, they're just binary values. So we're just saying that one represents iris setosa if it's there in the first, if it's the first number. And then if it's the second number, uh, we create another if statement. If labels i is equal to iris virginica, then we append zero, one. Which basically is saying, which is basically saying now, if you see something that a label that corresponds to Iris Virginica or the second type, or in our training example, uh, we want Y to be appended with zero one this time, showing that this value holds the uh, features for Iris Virginica and not Iris Setosa. And then now we can finally create the NumPy array for Y. And for features, since we're already pretty much done with the features, we've pre-processed it, we can actually call it X. Because now we're finally ready to pass it on to our machine learning algorithm. And we run it. Okay, hold on. Okay, my bad. Okay, so now we can actually go on to building our model. So Colab, since it was created by Google, and TensorFlow, it's also created by Google, naturally we'd expect Colab to have some support for using TensorFlow. So we can easily say import TensorFlow as TF. Again, if you want more details and documentation for TensorFlow, you can visit tensorflow.org, and you can see the cool kinds of playgrounds and the data sets they provide for quick experimentation. So we are importing TensorFlow. And in TensorFlow, we have this submodule called Keras, which it comprises of other functions or smaller functions that's gonna help us build a model with even fewer lines of code. So we can say from TensorFlow dot, mo from dot Keras dot models import sequential. So sequential is a class or an object uh, that basically holds the different layers for a neural network. So neural networks, uh, they consist of multiple layers and information passes through each of the layers and performs different computations depending on what kind of layer it is. And sequential is just basically a container for all of these layers. So what we'll be doing is we'll be using this thing called the dense layer, which basically represents one neuron or one set of neurons or one layer, and we call from tensorflow.keras.layers import dense. Dense, yeah. So, so far does anyone have any questions with the pre-processing steps? Because now we're actually gonna go, we're gonna dive into creating tensorflow models and passing in data through it. Next. Since we have uh, called the modules we need for TensorFlow, we call them and yeah, we click a new cell. 
model equals sequential. Again, I said that sequential is an object which basically represents a container for the layers. And since a single layer perceptron is, uh, consists of a single layer, we'll just be doing model.add. So add is a function that basically uh, takes that layer and dumps it into our sequential container. Dense is an other object which basically takes in the, the input and gives the output. So earlier I said that it assumes a y equals mx relationship and then applies the activation function on it, right? So in this dense function, we'll be doing exactly that. So over here, there are two kinds of flowers that we're trying to predict, either iris virginica or iris setosa. So we're gonna put the number of, new, with number of output uh, gates as two, or the output units as two. So depending on the probability value for either one of those two uh, units, we'll know which kind of flower it belongs to. Next, we have the input shape. So what input shape is, is it's the dimensions of the training data that we're putting into it. So since here we're using only four attributes, we'll just say four comma, because four represents the petal length, petal width, sepal length, and sepal width. And then activation. So earlier in the slides, I mentioned that we're gonna be using the sigmoid activation function, which basically takes really large values and squashes it to a value between zero and one, such that it gives us a probability value of what the inputs could correspond to. Next up, we have the compilation step. So in TensorFlow, you need to compile the model. Basically, uh, we need to give it the loss function. So the loss, you can just type loss equals mean square error. So this formula I showed you here for the loss function, it's called the mean square error formula uh, or the mean square error loss function. There are, all, there are different kinds of loss functions that you can find documentation for it on the TensorFlow website. You have things like hinge loss, absolute loss, uh, categorical cross entropy, but all these are the terms we won't be discussing it today. So uh, mean squared error is our preferred choice of loss function. Epochs is, sorry, uh, optimizer. So the optimizer is out of the scope of this workshop, but what the optimizer does is it basically makes the running of this algorithm much faster, uh, depending on what kind of system I'm using. So here I'll just be using Adam. Uh, Adam stands for adaptive momentum, which is another machine learning term, but we won't be getting into that. Uh, you can ignore the optimizer bit, but add it in your code. And then, the, for the metrics, what metrics are is basically what we're looking at for the model. So of course, we're gonna be looking at the mean square error. So through gradient descent and backpropagation, you should observe that the loss values keep decreasing over time. So if I took the loss values from our original linear regression code, and uh, I, wa actually, I, was I was actually supposed to print them out, you can see that the values are decreasing, which shows that the line is becoming closer to the best fit line because it's giving a smaller error, and that's shown by the decreasing values. So for the metrics, we wanna observe the mean square error or that difference, and we also wanna measure its accuracy for the model. So now that we're done compiling it, you can actually in TensorFlow, you can actually get a summary of your model. It actually prints out this really detailed table of your model. Yeah. So as we can see, we passed, so this is like the container. You can assume it to be a box, and then the different layers are basically things that we put in into that container. So over here, we passed in one dense layer or one single layer uh, for the single layer perceptron, which is shown over here. And we can see that we're giving two, uh, uh, we have two output units, one for iris setosa and one for iris virginica. So the one with the higher value at the end shows what flower type it belongs to. Next up, we can finally, uh, we can actually train this algorithm. Now that we have the X and Y variables in our hands, we have the model, we can say model.fit. 
So I'm storing this, mod this training cycle in this variable called history or training history. Uh, the training history is going to contain our metrics and the values for the mean square error or that difference as well as accuracy. And I pass in x, y, and just as in linear regression, we pass in the number of rounds. So again, the football player, when he's kicking the ball, he takes multiple rounds to finally score the goal. Uh, so similarly, we have multiple rounds of optimizing the values. Uh, so here, we're going to just take something like 50. Because since it's a neural network and it assumes a nonlinear relationship, the good thing is we don't need to train it for something like 1,000 rounds. We can train it for something as less than, like, as close to 10 or 50, depending on how much data you have. And finally, if you were to run this, you can actually, so TensorFlow gives you this really nice visualization of your training cycle. So for all these 100 examples and for these epochs, it completes all of them and it actually gives you your metrics. So over there we said we wanted to see its mean squared error or the average mean squared error and the accuracy for the training cycle for each round. And if you actually compare, you can see that on average these values keep decreasing. And this shows that a model is actually learning. Because the lower the loss value, it shows that the models learn better because the predictions are less off or less different from what it's supposed to be. And we can see that the accuracy is also improving, which is a good thing. And wow, we actually achieved a 98% accuracy on this. So when you, so this shows that the training cycle was really good and that uh, the model has performed really well. So if you actually take this model and you were able to uh, put this into production and you can actually send it so that billions of people can use it across the world, uh, it would be really accurate in its predictions, which is a good thing. Next, we uh, want to see whether the loss values are decreasing. So, so the training history variable, uh, we can convert this training history object into a dictionary by simply typing in double underscore D-I-C-T, a double underscore. And that basically gives us a dictionary form of our training history. And then we can see this dictionary over here. And again, if we access the history uh, key over here. So I'm assuming that most of you know how to work with dictionaries in Python. So dictionaries consist of a key value pair where each value corresponds to a specific key. So similarly, in this object over here, in this dictionary object, we can see that it has different things like do validation, metrics, uh, params, which is basically your parameters. Uh, and we'll be accessing the history key with it, and under that, we'll access the loss. And if we print it, you can actually see that the values are decreasing over time, which show that the model is training really well. And if you were to do some further analysis on this, you can actually put this into a variable called losses. And for epochs or rounds, you can actually uh, use NumPy. Uh, there's this function called a range, which just basically gives you uh, one, two, three, four, all the way to that number you specify. So over here, we have been training it for 50 epochs. So we'll just put this as 50. We'll run this. And then uh, we'll import matplotlib again for some graphing to see if the loss is really decreasing over time and to see performance. And if we were to plot the losses against, sorry, the epochs against the loss, you'd actually get this. And we can see that the loss function all keeps decreasing throughout our training cycle. We don't see any sudden peaks that show that the model suddenly messed up in that training cycle, which shows that a model is either ready for production or is really good. 
But the problems with machine learning uh, is that sometimes when we have too few of training instances, here we only had 100, and it's actually surprising that we got the accuracy of close to 98, because when I tried it earlier, I got something that was less than 50% accurate. So we can see that the number of training examples you have show how well the model is going to be when fully trained, because the more number of examples you have, the better the performance, which is analogous to doing math problems. For example, you're really bad at doing one type of math problems. The more you solve those kind of problems, the better you get so that when you do the exam, you can actually score really high marks on those kind of problems, which shows that you trained well on that kind of problem. So now that we've finished uh, building our single layer perceptron, uh, that is it for the coding part. So now it's time for some concluding words. Now that we've finished building our linear regression and single layer perceptron, we can actually see that for real life cases in different use cases across different industries, machine learning is really helpful. But the thing is, currently machine learning is at a state where it's still inaccessible to many which makes me really happy that you know youths like from junior college all the way uh, to professionals are coming for these kind of talks, right? So shout out to all of you because you're, uh, you're progressing and uh, putting your best foot forward. So as to learn machine learning, you can apply it to any data set you have, any real life problem. And with the power you now possess to build machine learning algorithms, you can solve major problems that the world is facing. You can optimize it for anything you want. But the problem with machine learning is that, you know, as we can see from the linear regression example, there's lots of math involved, lots of concepts that are really abstract for some to understand, which is why it takes lots of time and effort to learn. But uh, this workshop is, well, an attempt to democratize AI education. So, a professor at Stanford University, Professor Andrew Ung, he was from Raffles Institution in Singapore. He went to Stanford and is now a professor there. He, his big objective or big aim is to democratize AI, put AI or machine learning into the hands of all different age groups so that anyone is capable of solving world, world scale issues and problems. And this workshop is one of many steps taken by governments and organizations around the world such that anyone can uh, uh, be motivated or interested in learning machine learning and computer science in general because you guys are the wizards of tomorrow and the solutions you have, they are limited by your imagination. Uh, and with that, you can uh, thank you for attending this workshop. Uh, if you have any problems or any issues or you just want to chat, uh, about anything related to tech, machine learning, you can uh, you can contact me on uh, either GitHub, uh, LinkedIn, Medium, or uh, Twitter. Uh, so yeah, uh, and then if you're a student who takes computing at school, uh, I mean, if you take uh, computing in secondary school or uh, for your A levels and you are keen on writing the com a computer science wave or you're in generally interested in teaching others how tech works and how computer science is able to change industries. Uh, building blocks, as I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, well, hiring. So uh, please do contact us if you're interested in joining, giving these kind of talks, because not only is it an investment in your portfolio, you're enabling others to learn and improving their lives as well. Uh, and with that, uh, yeah. Thank you all for attending this workshop. Thank you. Uh, any questions, uh, single layer perceptron related or linear regression related, anything in general about machine learning? Uh, hold on, let me just get the mic to you so that everyone can listen. Was I was thinking about uh, chaos theory, and is there any um, ways to actually um, go along with that uh, chaos theory? Uh, oh, yeah, I think. OK, 
Uh, so the question was, uh, okay, so there's this thing called KL divergence, which is a uh, really complicated machine learning terminology. Uh, KL divergence is one kind of problem that really hasn't been optimized yet. Uh, I mean, to all of you who uh, kind of have a knowledge of machine learning, you may know that it's uh, an unsolved problem we're still trying to get there. But as of now, the state of computing, uh, KL divergence hasn't been solved. But that's a really high level question. Uh, you do not need to worry about that. If you have any other questions, anyone? All right then, I think we can wrap it up for tonight. So Friday night, been a really long day for most of you. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'll just be like standing over here, so if you're too shy to ask here, you can like talk to me here. <laughs>